Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, logging in. Welcome to the second Orkney Soil and Nutrient Network farm meeting based at Lycan in Sandwick in Orkney. I'm Graham Scott. I work for SEC um, in the Kirkwall office, and I'm joined today by Gavin Eilrick, who's a specialist soil and drainage consultant based in Turriff. This work's taken him Hi, all over the country, typically, and much further afield, including Germany and Spain. And those of you that have done any facts or basis training or qualifications might recognise Gavin as one of the tutors. And finally, in the background, we've got Malcolm McDonald, assistant, and he's based in the Inverness office. So if you could move to the next slide, please, Malcolm. Um, the agenda for today. Um, I'll go over and elaborate on some of what was touched on in meeting one, um, which will include a bit on phosphate, and I'll also speak about the the lichen cattle slurry that we analysed. And I'll also say a bit about potash. Gavin will then cover soil makeup and structure, including discussion on some of the examples of what we found at lichen. And Gavin will make some suggestions on possible remedial action where that's appropriate. So phosphate, yeah, we touched on low phosphate on the farm in meeting one. And I feel it's necessary to say a, pretty, a little bit more about phosphate. Phosphorus, as you know, is a key nutrient for all plants. It's contained in many of the plant structures, including the DNA. And it plays a big role in many of the processes, including photosynthesis, respiration, energy storage and transfer, and cell division. And um, in the plant, it'll, it, I mean, it's important for root development, and any deficiency will manifest itself in stubby roots, similar to what you'd see with low pH. And also plants that are deficient, they'll appear stunted quite often, and the older leaves will quite often look blue, which isn't an uncommon sight in ordinary. Phosphate's important for plant strength as well, and certainly in spring barley, um, phosphate deficiency can increase the chances of the crops going flat. And again, it's important for maturity and ripening of crops as well. And again, in spring barley and ordinary, it's very important because we've got such a short um, with our window for harvesting. Anything that's going to prolong the ripening of the crops not good. So keeping phosphate levels at the uh, recommended levels is a very important thing. The phosphate levels in the soil declines mainly because of what's taken off in the crops. Um, and as written in the slide there, a silage crop yielding 10 tonne per acre is going to remove about 17 kilos of phosphate. Phosphate will also be removed for the for the soil um, from soil runoff. Um, so don't plough steep sloping fields in the back end if there's any risk that the soil is going to get washed off. Um, the phosphate iron itself, it's got a negative. Um, it's, it's, it's negative, so it binds quite well to the soil particles. So generally, it's quite difficult to wash it through the soil profile, it stays in the soil quite good. Um, yeah, um, I should also say that the availability of phosphates, as it says in the slide, is reduced by low temperature, poor soil structure, and incorrect pH, and also any conditions which are not going to be favourable to soil microbes as they're involved in releasing phosphate from organic and organic sources in the soil. Uh, next slide, please. This shows the target for phosphate um, in red there. You really want to, to hit the moderate minus category, which is where the phosphates um, are between 4.5 and 9.4 milligrams per litre. Going above the moderate minus category isn't going to be cost effective. Um, you're not really in grassland, you're not going to get any yield or quality benefit by going into the moderate plus category. Um, it'll cost you a lot of money and um, you, you won't see any benefit. So for grassland, aim for moderate minus. Next slide, please. So we analysed all the fields at Lycan and um, this shows you the results. 
Um, a lot of the fields were low. There were only two that were in the target moderate minus category, which is marked in green. That said, the fields that were low, most of them were only just low. They were just falling out of the moderate minus category. So um, they're, they're not, it won't take too much to pull them up. Next slide, please. Yeah, this next slide is simply uh, a poll, which is hopefully going to be interactive. Yeah, it just asks everybody what product they would typically use, or what would be their main choice of product for raising low phosphate levels in the soil. So you'll see the three grouped together there, your triple superphosphate, your diammonium phosphate, and your monoammonium phosphate. Those are all the fast-acting, water-soluble um, fertilizers, which are readily available for plant uptake. And they're all made by treating rock phosphate with acids. Um, you've got your FYM, your farmyard manure and your slurry. You've got your pot ale um, in Orkney, a lot of that will come from Highland Park. Um, and quite often the recommendation is 25 cube to the hectare which is equivalent to 2,200 gallon per acre, and that's going to give you about 16 kilos of phosphate. And then we have the GAFSA, which is the rock phosphate. It's really good in that it, uh, it's slow release. So you're going to get phosphate um, release over maybe three to four years for rock for, for the, from the GAFSA. Um, and it's also a component of Scott Foss and Fossman products, but you need a lower pH for it. Um, so that's where results in there, which is good. So that's quite surprising. Zero of the attendees have said they use triple superphosphate of that and that. Um, 50% would use the GAFSA. That's the good slow release rock phosphate. And then a quarter for slurry and FYM. And a quarter for the fibrophos, which is your burnt hen muck. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, next slide, please. So back to lichen. So 17 of the 19 fields which were analysed for phosphate were low. Um, there's a SAC technical note 715 called phosphate and potash recommendations for crops grown in the highlands and islands. And it states that it can take 241 kilos of phosphate per hectare to raise the soil phosphate level from one milligram per litre. That's the very low category up to the middle of the moderate minus category. And it goes on to say to raise the phosphate level by four um, micrograms per litre for two to six could take, well, they recommend 50 kilos per hectare of phosphate. And they recommend applying that every year for between three and four years to raise a soil from very low into the moderate minus category. So that's that is a significant amount of phosphate. Um, and for those of you that are slightly more old school, to convert kilos per hectare to units per acre, you multiply by 0.8. So you're 50 kilos per hectare. Oh, phosphate's the equivalent, equivalent of roughly 100 weight per acre of triple super phosphate, 0, 0.46, 0. Uh, and if we can go to the next slide, please. So phosphate options, common phosphate options here in Orkney would be your triple superphosphate, which was £323 a tonne. The diammonium phosphate was about £360 a tonne. And you'll see it's got a useful nitrogen component in it. So a lot of guys would apply that in the spring to give the grass a bit of a boost. And the soluble phosphate and the nitrogen together, it's a good product. Fibrophos there, 0, 14, 14. You get different makeups of fibrophos. Um, but I dare say for low phosphate, you're going to um, want the 0, 14, 14. So I think that's the one with the highest phosphate level in it. It's 198 pound a ton. And then the, the MARP and the GAFSA. Um, so next slide, please. So back to the, the MARP. Um, actually, you'll see that. Um, if we just keep it simple and if we stick to triple superphosphate, it's the product of choice. I'm not saying that's the right one. Most of the fields will only need one hundredweight per acre of triple superphosphate, a one-off application, which would be applied over and above any other fertilizer, which needs to go on to match offtakes to raise the levels. Um, 
there's two fields which would require more than that um, field. Uh, well, I don't have them marked on there. They're both still in the low category, but they're uh, they're they're virgin and they're very low, and they'll typically need two hundred white per acre of triple superphosphate. And instead of spreading that in one ear, I'd probably apply one hundred weight one ear and one hundred weight the next. And for any remedial action, I would ensure the fields resampled the following year to see um, that you've reached your goal. Uh, next slide, please. So slurry, yeah, I'll speak a wee bit about the slurry analysis that was carried out on the lichen. Um, they've two distinct um, types of slurry. They've got the slatted cork with the suckler coos in it, which we've called simply lichen coo slurry. And then they've got the other slatted cork with the fostered calves or weaned calves in it. Um, and the the comparisons made with the um, average analysis from another technical note, 650. Um, so the results really shows you who superior the diet is for the weaned cattle. Obviously, your weaned cattle are going to be fed a far better diet than your, um, your suckler coo for most of the winter. Um, their protein requirements is far higher. So that would explain why there's so much more nitrogen in the weaned calf slurry, 18.88 kilos per 1,000 gallon, um, compared to the other two types. Phosphate's always also a good bit higher, 7.7 .7 kilos in 1,000 gallon, compared to the to the coo slurry. And again, the potash as well is a good bit higher. So there's a lot of variation between the two types of slurry on the farm. And the table at the bottom simply shows that a thousand gallon of the coo slurry is equivalent to a hundredweight of 61034 if there was such a thing and the um the the better weaned calf slurry slurry is equivalent to 11 15 39. notice that uh, the nitrogen content i've reduced it slightly because you'll never your plants will never get the full benefit of the nitrogen that's contained in a slurry because a lot, well, it depends on various factors, including the time application and the method of application. A lot would be lost to the atmosphere, a lot would be volatilized and lost to other sources as well. Um, next slide, please. I should also say that your slurry analysis, you don't, you, only need, you don't need to do it every year unless your diets are changing markedly year on year. Um, there shouldn't be much much difference really. So you only really need to sample your your slurry once. I don't know five or six years. It will cost you about thirty pound a sample. Um, but if you're drawing the sample, take it as mixed. Take it as if you were applying it to the field. So um, take the sample after you've mixed it in the time. Um, I wanted to put a value on the slurry too, um, and that's what this slide shows. I've based that on the, the straights, if you like, um, your straight nitrogen, your 34.5% N at 257 pound a tonne works out at 75 pence per kilogram of N. So I've used the same um, calculation to work out the cost of per kilo of the phosphate and the potash to using the value of triple superphosphate at 323 and new rate of potash at 324. So the table shows what uh, each slurry is worth um, in a thousand gallons. So your your coo slurry, your, the cattle slurry as we've called it, works out at fifteen pounds twenty one per thousand gallons, and your wind calf slurry is a good bit more at twenty pound twelve. So. I mean, your slurry tanker, I mean, typically they're going to hold a couple of thousand gallons. So you're driving up the road with 30 pounds worth of one type of slurry and 40 pounds worth of uh, the wean calf slurry. So it comes to quite a bit. So it's important, as you all know, to try and apply that valuable product at times of the year when it's going to get most benefit, if you can. I would suggest if you're spreading any in October at this time of year that you know, it's it's not the best um, point of time to get the most value out of that. And also, as well as the NP and K content, there's the unquantifiable added benefit of the organic matter that's in it as well. Um, 
that's that's stuff that you can't buy out of a bag, so you've got that added benefit as well. Um, next slide, please. So off take a phosphate, that's worth pointing out too. Um, <clears throat> this shows that for a silage with a dry matter, 25%, um, a yield of nine tonne per acre, which would be fairly average, is gonna pull out over 15 kilos per acre of phosphate out of your field. Basically every ton of silage that comes off the field is gonna take off 1.7 kilos per ton of phosphate. For grazing, it's different in that um, 80% of what the animal consumes is recycled back onto the grass and through the dung and the, the urine. So grazing, you don't need to apply anything like as much phosphate to balance the offtake. It's the, the silage and also any any crops, particularly if the straw is removed as well. And that's where the damage can be done. Um, if What's taken off is not replaced. Uh, and the next slide, please. This is a bit uh, muddled, this slide, but simply it's just telling you the, the volume of slurry required to replace the phosphate removed in a silage crop, yielding nine tonne per acre, 3,100 gallon per acre, or the coo slurry at lichen, or only 2,000 gallon per acre, or the calf slurry. Um, and as we mentioned before, for trying to address the deficiencies, the volume of slurry required to supply the 50 kilos per hectare of phosphate to, ra to raise the low soil level in many of the fields is, well, it's 4,000, the equivalent of 4,000 gallon per acre of the coo slurry, or just 2,600 gallon per acre of the calf slurry. I should mention too that the PEP for code which is the prevention of environmental pollution from agricultural activity. The pet for code restricts slurry applications. Um, surface applications shouldn't really exceed 50 cube per hectare, which is 4,500 gallon per acre. It shouldn't really exceed that, although typically your applications would maybe much more than 2,000 or well, certainly under 3,000 gallon per acre. And remember also that any repeat applications shouldn't be within three weeks of each other. Uh, and next slide, please. Potash. Yeah, it's, I'm going to say less about potash because it isn't an issue on this firm, but uh, potash is, is very important, as you all know, as the slide says. Deficiencies in potash will read to can lead to well, lodging in your barley again, or reduce photosynthesis. Um, it's important for drought susceptibility. It's actually the potash of the K is important for the opening and closing of the stomata on the underside of the leaf. So it's important for water regulation and any deficiencies can uh, impact on, on yield. Um, next slide. This simply shows the target that's highlighted in green in your soils, so you want to hit the moderate minus category again, which is between 76 and 140 milligrams per litre. Again, the going above that's not going to benefit you any at all. In fact, it could do more damage than good. So moderate minus is where you're wanting to, to be for growing spring barley and autumn and for, for growing grass. And the next slide. This shows the results of um, the soil analyses in all the fields. As you'll see, none of them were low. They're all um, moderate or above. In fact, we've got some high ones as well, um, marked by the orangey colour. Um, so I guess that reflects the amount of slurry that's on the farm. There's lots of slurry, which is high in potash, that's sprayed in a lot of these fields, which makes it potash levels really really good in all of them so there's no remedial action required there at all if the potash levels were low going back to the technical note i referred to before an application now between 150 and 250 kilos per hectare of potash in excess of what's removed by the crop would be required to raise the soil potash concentration by 50 um, milligrams per litre and the lower rate the 150 um, would be required in the, the lighter soils. And then the uh, 
final slide for me, please. This simply shows the off take apart ash and what you need to do to replace what you're taking off um, in the silage. <clears throat> One ton of silage removes six kilos of pot ash. So a yield of silage at nine ton per acre is going to remove 54 kilos. A thousand gallon of the lichen coo slurry contains 17.25 kilos of potash. So you need 3,100 gallon per acre to replace 54 kilos that's taken off um, in an average yield. And a thousand gallon of the lichen calf slurry contains 19 and a half kilos um, of potash. So you need only 2,800 gallon per acre of wet to replace what's taken off. So I guess that's typical figures. That's what a lot of farmers in Orkney will certainly be applying to their aftermath. So um, yeah, potash levels aren't an issue on like and, and they generally aren't an issue on most livestock farms in the county. Um, okay, I think that's that was my last slide. So I'll um, pass you over to to Gavin now. Yeah, I'll just. That simply gives a, uh, yeah, it's, well, it basically tells you how much slurry is on the farm. There's 235,000 gallons of the coo slurry and 134,000 gallons of the weaned calf slurry. And plus there's a finishing house as well with a further 134,000 gallons. So half a million gallons of slurry on the farm. So you can see why potash isn't an issue. Okay, Gavin, over to you. Hi, folks. Um, I'm going to just cover a wee bit on the soil um, and texture and the structure and a bit on compaction. We're looking at the typical um, soil makeup is they're looking at about 50% split roughly evenly between uh, air and uh, water, and the remaining 50% is solid material, either organic matter or minerals. It, these percentages will move about a bit depending on the soils you're uh, working with. The and the the, the organic matter is, far, is as we'll see is far higher in the, the, the Orkney soils compared to to what you would get in an arable situation across Scotland. You could be two three percent down in East East Lothian and in the mi mixed farming or livestock farming are easier above twelve percent. Um, so you, there is a big difference. And we'll also see the importance of that organic fraction as we go on. Can you get the next slide, please, Malcolm? Right. Soil texture is the is the is only looked on as the solid part of the the soil. Um, it only takes account of the, the sand, silt, and clay fractions. Um, sand being the largest, and in the middle you've got the silt and in the smallest you've got clay um, and depending on what the class your soil texture then you will see that the uh, the percentages of how the percentage of sand salt and clay vary Get the next slide please so the soil texture classes are all made up into the, the following this is the, the british uh, soil science uh, texture triangle and it shows you depending where your percentages of sand, silt, and clay land will depend on uh, what type of texture your soil is. Um, it could be really light down the sand to the opted clay, which is the really heaviest and probably the most difficult to work is probably a silty clay or a silty clay loam, just because um, issues with those soils. But certainly, the the clay is we're we're unlikely in this part of the world to get clay as the as it's said in the texture triangle but quite often a lot of the soils behave like clay just because of the, the different fractions of fines um, makes them easy to compact. Okay, the next slide please. So this is the soil map um, we've got the two soil types we've got um, Bilser is the the brown soil and the, uh, the blue soil is Thurzo. Now, Thurzo is classed as a imperfectly drained or poorly drained um, mineral glay, and the Bilbster is a freely drained, probably close to imperfectly drained uh, um, brown soil. Now, the map is showing 
a distinct line between the two uh, soil types. In practice, that is rarely happens. And on the edges of the two soils, you'll get get either a mix of different of the two soil associations, or slightly better than one, slightly poorer than the other type of thing. And that'll extend for a number of uh, meters either side of the line. Um, and that line won't be be straight. Can I get the next one, please. So we've got the, the texture, soil texture at Bilbster. Um, it's classed as 40% um, uh, sand, 47% silt, and only 13% clay, which puts us as in a sandy silt clay. Um, and you can see that, that the, there's very little clay, but there's a lot of silt and sand, and probably fine sand as well, which these add to give you possible structural issues we'll deal with later in the in the presentation. Get the next slide, please, Malcolm. We've got Thurzo, and it's much similar, but slightly more sand, a wee bit less silt, and a wee bit more clay, which is sort of creeping up to the clay loam, the boundaries of this the sandy silt uh, loam, clay loam boundary. Um, so you're getting a wee bit of difference, and that's probably why it makes makes a difference. When the next one is just an example of what happens when you adjust the amount of percentages. So we haven't shifted the, the silt and sand much, but we've increased the clay um, to 25% rather than 15 that was shown in um, Thurzo. Um, and this gives us, it moves us up into a clay loam. Now, if we go into the next slide, we'll see what they call a sandy clay loam, where we've moved. What you'd think of plenty of sand, but we also got a lot more clay and very little silt. And this puts us into a, probably a more difficult texture to, to work as well. So if we could, can I move on to the, the next slide, please? Um, and this is the, the difference between the soils and these sandy loams, sandy silt loams are very reliant on the uh, organic matter to help mitigate the problems that you can get with structure and also to because we've got little very little clay percentage in them they they could be nutrient poor if they don't have a decent amount of organic matter in them as the nutrients are mainly if not all held on either this clay fraction or the the, the organic f fraction um so and it also helps improve your st structure and mitigates it against some of the issues with your, with your soil texture, and it buffers your pH and helps helps hold up the pH. Um, whereas if if you had very little um, a, a organic matter in the soil, then we would start to see the the pH drop quicker, and it would need more lime to bring it up, or more lime more often rather than more lime. Yeah. Just, yeah. It would drop away quicker. Um, it also, as we're looking at, it provides a a food source for um, for your uh, bacteria biology in the soil, which is, as um, Graham mentioned earlier, is important for breaking up the, the available, making available the phosphate in the soil. So, get the next slide, please. So, we're looking at the two two soils we've got, and their their mean um, <laughs> a, organic mass measured by the loss of ignition, which Measure, measures the total total um, uh, total uh, organic matter. So we're we'll quite too good. 12.8 percent and 10.2, which is compared to the, the, the example I used at the start of the presentation was only about five. So yet the the farms here are doing pretty well, which is is not to be unexpected on a livestock farm with mainly grass in the rotation. Um, that tends to be and also applying organic matter all the time in the form of slurry or dung um, it can it really helps keep keep that levels up and you can see the difference in a, a a farm that has moved away from livestock you can see it in Aberdeenshire down here um, mixed farms are around about the 10 percent but you can easily down to five six percent for a, a farm that's moved away to, to mainly cropping you get the next slide please so the benefits of organic matter, just a quick roundup of them. It helps and develops your soil structure, which we're gonna go on to look at next. Um, it supplies your mineral nutrients. 
um, in the form that if you don't have a lot of clay, it holds on to some of the minerals like potash, uh, sulfur, and various micronutrients as well. Uh, increases your water holding capacity, uh, which in some cases is one of the one of the issues is we're, we're probably getting too much holding the water capacity, but it also increases the drainage because it keeps the the soil structure out, so it helps remove adjust the drainage. So it, it's it's a, it's a good thing. Up to a point, once you're getting too much organic matter, you're moving into peats above 15%. You start to get a few issues. Um, in various conditions with that but generally uh, in a, a, a more worked soil we're not looking at any anything like that and uh, so we're, we're generally having problems as i mentioned it's a substrate for the soil organisms but one of the key things it, it darkens your soil which increase in the spring helps increase the rate of warming and keeps the soil warmer longer into the autumn right, next slide please right there's been a lot of discussions on calcium magnesium ratios recently and we kind of take the take the view that ratios are all right but the, you can easily adjust a ratio you could you could have the rate both um calcium magnesium at low and still have the correct ratio or you can have it both high and still have the correct ratio what we would tend to target is to make sure that your um you both your calcium and magnesium levels in your soil are at at least in the moderate category and possibly not not heading towards the the high um so all the soils all uh, the magnesium levels are all within the, the moderate category for liking one of the things the reason that a lot of the ones have, have dropped down with the lower ratios is the calcium levels are lower in these fields um and that could just be maybe over the years it might be lighter fields and it has there hasn't been a lot of calcium lime added um and that could could be bring it up <clears throat> one of the issues other options to to if you if calcium lime is not available is possible to look at using gypsum which would help bring up the calcium levels and um, sets calcium sulfate and it will also be quite a good thing for uh, sulfur for um for uh, for the silage fields um sulfur to help the utilization of the nitrogen and creation of protein um we'll get the next slide please so we're now looking at cation exchange now this is the the real key thing where um so, uh, organic matter replaces clay because it's the, that's the only two things sand sand and silt don't have a, a charge on them and they don't hold onto nutrients whereas clay and organic matter both do hold on to the to um nutrients and they so they're both ho holding your your nutrients so you you the key thing is for for holding on to to certain nutrients um is essential to have that in the soil um the good level are in a sandy soil possibly would be low um in a clay soil i find this possibly hard because if you've got a soil it's up up in a, a high percentage um i find that you you'll be doing okay if you've got that in a clay a clay the reason that clay will be difficult to manage in our climate anyway just due to the to the quantity of um, rainfall we have compared uh, against the the natural sunlight and heat levels that we get um in this part of the world compared to we would have maybe down in the the southeast of england where there's a lot more heavy clays but they've also far warmer soils uh, there as well okay, get the next slide please So moving on to soil structure, um, if we may pass on that, this is the kind of the important thing in, in one of the issues you, you will get with uh, soils with high levels of silt and fine sand. As you can see, the the example on the left hand side is a good good structure with the water flowing through. Um, but on the right hand side, we've got a, a packed surface, um, which is quite common with livestock, even with sheep. 
if they're out in wet weather, you'll get in a silty soil, you'll get that seal, seal <coughs> excuse me, sealing of the surface, which just stops the rest of the soil profile working, and you end up getting water ponding this on the surface and running off taking some of that valuable uh, phosphorus that uh, Graham was speaking about earlier with it. So the, the key thing is we want to have a good structure to enable the roots to get down through the profile and pick up as much nutrient as it can so we can get, maximize the benefit of the, the crop and, and get the yield, the optimum yield for that uh, soil group. Can you next slide, please? Thanks. Uh, this this is uh, a vest, what they call a vest, uh, scope um, chart and you can use it for uh, checking over the your soil you, you just dig a pit and you can check it over um, and you're aiming to have the majority of the the structure in what they call uh, grades one and two and um, down in th three you're starting to get issues and in four and five we're we're having a lot of problems which they'll the water will be ponding in the surface and you'll be starting to get as the picture in the, the bottom right hand side shows the blue gray colors. Ideally what we're looking is nice oranges and browns, um, but that's in, the blue grays is, is showing the examples of poor uh, structure, it just packed. And it quite often happens on silty and fine sandy soils, you'll get it packed together quite easily, but generally they're relatively easy to unpack. Um, though more difficult in grassland, um, because we have, because it's a permanent crop, you, you, you tend to have to make sure that any remedial measures is not going to cause issues with the, the surface for taking off cuts of silage or for problems with grazing and stones and that. So get the next slide, please. So the benefits of good structure is it improves your rooting and aeration and reduces your water logging because it allows the water to move through the profile and away from the surface, which it helps the roots uh, and the plants grow, pick up, they can get water and the nutrient levels where they're not uh, saturated out. Um, and we also get reduces droughtiness. It's 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 quite a, an issue that you where you have problems with compaction, you get problems with water logging. But because the roots are all restrained and a very little of the soil profile to move in, it also ends up we have problems if the, we get droughty weather. So you can end up with, with the soil giving you two, two problems for the price of one. Can you get the next slide, please? So this is some of the samples that we're taking um, in the uh, at Liking. And we've got one here, the spring barley. It's, it had a organic matter of 10.8. You can see a nice crumbly soil. It had a few root worms, um, six worms were picked up in it, which is not bad for an arable, uh, arable field. Um, it's likely it hasn't been long out of grass, but it's got a nice soil structure. Um, and we can see that, that it's probably been worked in good conditions. Okay, the next slide, please. So now we've got 40 years old grass and we're starting to get a few issues in that. It still is a good root, com roots are coming through, but it's it's a bit more blocky. And we we can see it's probably been taken from, I would say it's probably been taken from the soil um, series Thurzo, um, because of the, you can see there's round about the root hairs, you've got orange um, uh, mottling on it. And that's generally a sign of the, so the the iron in the soil being oxidized near the root hairs, which means the oxygen's flowing down that. And so the rest, at times, the rest of the soil will be waterlogged. The the structure is not too bad. And I think the worms were pretty good. There was 40 worms. So it's always a good biological life in it, which you would expect that the 40 year old grass hasn't been uh, um, blown down, but it's probably got a few, few, few structural issues that it, it's probably needing to be a bit of work done to it. Get the next slide, please. It's just an, another picture, close up, and you get a better view of the the, the orange mottling around the roots, but also the gray, greeny uh, mottling away from the roots um, and the soil, just the soil color showing it's, it's a bit of water logging in it um, over time. Get the next slide, please. 
So again, was this the poorest field? Um, again, it was. It actually it's surprising. Uh, it had no worms at all in it. Um, they were wondering it had a, an application of forefront T. So they're wondering if this has maybe killed the the worms off as well. There was a possibility uh, with it. Possibly the fact that it's mainly it's very waterlogged. You can see the blues and the greys in the soil. Um, it could be it's been waterlogged and there's worms don't don't tend to like they like a nice moist but not too dry um, uh, open soil to, to function in. It looks quite compacted and, and it's more or less one big lump. Um, so the, your roots are getting through, but I think the roots are through um, and they're quite thin and straggly. We're not looking at any big decent roots. It's looking at 100 millimeters depth approximately there. So I think we're We've got a few issues there. Possibly could be doing doing with improvement. So move to the next slide, please. So there, the poorest field again. You can see the lumps in it and the the big the big blocks, and um, which the roots. The what the, the main problem as well as the roots are not in getting through it is the water will only really flow through the cracks at the side. So you have less volume of um, space in the the soil structure to move the water and get air into the crops uh, as well. We'll get the next slide, please. So we're going on to soil compaction now, um, and I think there's a poll coming up. So, so if we get you to uh, fill in the, the poll, uh, what if you use anything at all? If you don't use anything, don't, don't uh, put down a, a, a vote. But we're, we're looking, looking at from the sword lifter, the big subsoil art, light spiked rollers, the heavy spiked rollers to the, the plow even. Because if you have relatively shallow complexion, then when you plow out for a reseed or cropping, that, that generally, especially on a, a sandy silt loam soil, will um, be plowed out and, and back to normal. That's quite interesting to see. Majority, oh, there's no, oh, the majority use the plow, which it's kind of, it's quite common. Um, a few with a light spike roller and a few of a quarter with the sword lifter. That's good to see. Um, next slide, please. And the next slide after that, please, Malcolm. Right, this just gives you an idea of the effects of compaction. Um, compared to the, the theoretical undisturbed soil we spoke about earlier at the start of the presentation, we go on to the compacted soil, um, and you can see that the, air, the organic matter has decreased, but also the soil air has really decreased um, when we've a most, more just a pack of material, of solid material. And quite often, this will become anaerobic, and you'll get issues with um, uh, with just poor availability of nutrients. You can you may have enough enough nutrients in the soil, but if the plants can't get at it, and or the microbes, especially the microbes, need to break down certain elements, then we'll we'll have issues with uh, its availability to the plants. Get the next slide, please. Right, zones of compaction. As you can see, we've got farmer going across the field with his tractor, and we've got Daisy the cow there wandering round about. Um, they all have zones of compaction. It's all dependent on on the weight and the pressure on the on the sound. And as the tractor's heavier, it will push the compaction levels down further than uh, Daisy does. Um, uh, but in upper layers. Daisy will, in the, on the wrong conditions, will cause issues. As we saw at the, the beginning of the soil structure presentation, we will get sealed surfaces, which will stop the, the, the soil getting uh, water and the nutrients moving through and more potential for washing off nutrients in the surface. We get the next slide, please. So we're looking at um, compaction and soil moisture with this um, slide. and the just to show you that the the deeper the heavier the, the axle load on a on a piece of soil the deeper the compaction level go and also the wetter the soil the deeper the compaction and the the amount of compaction will drop down 
And the reality is, and this slide is um, in old money, it's in um, inches, because it's a piece of work I've done in America, and the anything below 24 inches or 600 millimeters becomes very difficult to, to alleviate, especially so in grassland type uh, in the environment. And just to show this work was probably, this piece of work was done originally in 1958 um, in uh, the University of Minnesota. So this, this work has been looked at for a long time. So the problems we've been envisaging um, are not new. Next slide, please. So we're now on to sort of how do we remediate compaction? Um, we can look at uh, various types from shallow, and if you've got just a, a bit of surface capping with the silty soils, uh, and with like the light sheep compaction over a wet winter, then maybe going over with a, a shallow, uh, a forced tine harrow, will just enough to break up the surface and allow the, can the nitrogen to mineralize and help help uh, remove any compaction in that areas. Um, and also at the same time, if you've got one of the harrows with a grass seeder, it allows you to overseed um, uh, any gappy areas at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So now on to surface spikers. You're looking at, at there, we probably maximum maybe four to six inches. Generally, we're looking for about up to 100 millimeters, four inches is what we're aiming for with a spiker. The idea of that is to open up the surface and let um, down into the, the free drain in section of the, the compact of the of the soil profile and allowing water and that to to move off the surface. Um, generally, you're aiming for as light a piece of equipment as you can with any of these these compactions uh, machines. The, the idea is not to to put more compaction onto the soil. So the lighter you can get, the better to do the job. Next slide, please. So that's uh, we've now on to we've got a grass with a pan here, as we can see that the the flat horizontal section just below the the pen point, um, we can see there's a compact uh, section. We need what we're looking for is um, a piece of equipment to go down below that um, packed layer. So looking at the pen, that'd be roughly 100 millimeters to the tip of the pen, and maybe another 100 millimeters to get to below the the compact layer. So we're looking at a piece of equipment to that. A spiker or the harrow won't manage. So what we'll look on to is a sword lifter type machines. And we'll see that in the next slide. So we've got various types of piece of equipment, um, some with flat rollers, some with um, uh, spiked rollers. So the, the, the idea is you are looking at this piece, piece of kit and you set it up just below the compact layer, maybe 25 to 50 millimeters below. You don't want to be going any deeper than that um, because you end up, you burn more diesel um, than you need. Um, and also you've more chance, the deeper you go, the more heave you may get to the surface. And in a grassland situation, we're looking at trying to keep the surface, the finished surface as level as possible so we can get, um, uh, be able to utilize it for silage and that afterwards. And that, I think, is the end of my presentation. So if we went to back to Graham. Graham, thanks for that, Gavin. I guess the take home message there is to go to a spade to identify if there's any compaction. It is indeed. It is indeed. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that the best tool on the farm is the spade. Just go out and have a look and see what your, where your problems are. That's the, the key thing. And especially if you're doing sword lifting or spiking, is to do a bit um, and check that you've got the machine set by just digging back down just to see. Um, and if you've done done the job uh, right, then you should be able to be able to pick pick up where you've picked it up and or need to make an adjustment. You, hopefully, the, maybe the adjustment will be you can lift you can lift it up and save a bit less burning a bit less diesel so mm -hmm. if i can just ask a couple of questions gavin um what's the difference between organic matter and humus organic and matter and hu organic matter is classed as the total volume of uh, organic or the organic fraction in the soil humus is the the fraction that is 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 more or less inert and you don't uh, it's broken down to the to the to the 
is less likely to be lost. Right. And once you start losing the humus from the soil, it becomes far more, because this has taken thousands of years to produce them, that maybe not thousands, but certainly a long time to produce the humus fraction. Um, oh, so it's okay. quite it's fragile, it's, it's fragile first. But the organic matter could be like some bits of straw or roots from the plants that have uh, uh, recently added the humus, the humus fraction is as the stuff it's there for the long, been there for the long. Um, so the humus would be fully degraded, whereas the yes. organic yeah. matter will contain the stuff that's it could, still It'll contain degraded. both, and yeah. some of it's still partially degraded. So. And another question. Um, as you'll know, shale sand's used in Orkney for sorting yep. pH commonly. Is applying shale sand going to help my soil structure due to the calcium it contains? That'll be it linked will, to the it, it will that. help, yeah. It'll it it's it it should help uh, it's calcium. Um you need to probably worth uh, if you're doing it is get if you could use in, um shale sand is to get it tested for its calcium magnesium levels, but also its neutralizing value. Um uh, so, because that's key thing, because you need to, to interpret how much um, tons of shale sand you need to replace um, the tons of line that your recommendation will come in. Um, generally, you need more tons of, of um, shale sand than you would need lime, just because it's usually a lower neutralizing value. But saying that, there's some shale sands can be very, very high, so upwards of over 35% in, in some situations, yeah. but there's other ones can be down the level of 20%. So. Yeah, we've had some high ones here in Orkney, ones that are almost mm -hmm. comparable with, a, with lime, but typically you would be applying maybe one and a half, one and three quarter yep. ton of shale sand to the equivalent of a ton of the yep. lime. The so that, that w yeah, one of the benefits of that is, like you were saying, is if you're adding sand to a, a heavier soil, then you will help open it up um, but also, you have to be aware that at the same time, you're probably diluting your clay fraction, which is holding your nutrients. So mm -hmm. um, it's unlikely you, you ever be applying the, the, the quantities that's going to cause an issue. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's highly unlikely the tons, mm -hmm. tons that you're applying is, are going to be uh, causing problems in that situation. They'll probably be doing more good than they are uh, causing problems. Yeah, good. And uh, another question. Are spiked rollers, which claim to shatter hard pans at 30 centimetre deep, likely to do that or achieve that in Orkney? I would. Say I, I would. I would probably think. I would, doubt, I would, doubt, doubt. I, I would doubt it. I think my my only concern is you any of these big rollers is the weight that you're you're pulling onto the ground. Um, mm -hmm. You need to have the ground in really good conditions, and the worry that. If it is less less than perfect conditions, you're going to end up with a, a compact layer on the surface, um, as well as this this spike going down. Again, it's it's interesting. It's unlikely you're going to have the sword lifter will will take out anything. And if you've got um, pans at um, over a three a, between two and three hundred mil, then obviously there's been there's been issues, and it's it's probably the, the grass will be due for a replacement at that point. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then finally, what's your views on the very flexible tyres, which were included in the recent SACGS grant scheme? That's a sustainable I agricultural think it, 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 yeah, Anything that can spread the load of a tractor across the ground is, is uh, great. Um, but the, the key message you probably need to take home is the less weight that you can put on there in the first place is the is the key thing to be looking at. Um, and we're we're speaking about slurry systems. Um, they, from a slurry point of view, it's all a lot of it's tankers, which have generally been on the go. Um, but it's maybe one thing to be looking at um, is to be looking at umbilical systems that could be shared between a number of farms, um, where so you have a lot less. Um, weight going onto the land, um, especially if you're having to apply the, the slurry in the less than ideal times of the year. So. Yeah. There's another question came in here that says, yeah. uh, what is the best way to improve the 40-year-old grass sward, grass field? That was the it one with oxidized have, lumps in it. Yeah, yeah, it would depend. It, you, I would probably need a wee bit more than the, the, the field. I would possibly think if it's in a normal type rotation field, 
then I think it's probably due for a, um, a reseed. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it may be the case that it's in a very stony field, um, which it's it may be the case. We can we overseed with newer varieties, maybe try and overseed with some red clover or chicory into the mix with the help, maybe the root in depth to sort of punch open the, the soil if it's if you can surface seed on in a in a, a stony location. But if you can get off off with it, you should be able to improve it uh, anyway. Yeah. But I'm trying to remember what uh, David Lawson used to say about it's about every so many years the um, the new varieties improve the yield. Um, so yeah, you, yeah it's like it's a percentage worth, a year, isn't it? For yeah, the, it's, uh, yeah, it's worth worth the reseed um, after so many years. I think every ten years it's definitely worth it. So. Mm -hmm. And if you can't, I fully accept that the, some of the, the conditions are, are maybe not ideal for a ploughed reseed. So. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that, this will have to be our final question. It says here, uh, did you can like and save a bit and not put on bagged potash for a few years? That's uh, reverting back would, to the I fact would, that... Uh, yeah. I think if you are meeting all the requirements for your slurry application, there'd be no need to apply a... Um, Bag, except because certainly on the high fields and the the M plus fields, um, I would I would think there was a fine opportunity to save save uh, money by cutting back in your uh, um, potash. It's one of the one of the issues with too much high high potash levels is it interferes with the the magnesium and you start getting issues with the grazing livestock staggers. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Grand. Right, what time's about up there, Gavin? So I'll have to say thank you for everybody for logging in and attending. Thanks to Gavin and also thanks to Malcolm in the background for keeping everything together. Um, there'll be another webinar, the final one in the series in December sometime. Um, but thanks for attending and hopefully um, you can log in the next time as well. Okay, thanks very much and uh, cheerio.